Hey Optimancers, Chris here. Uh, so I'm going to be doing a build video on the Circle of the Shepherd Druid very soon. And as I was planning that video, I started to think I should probably talk a little bit about summoning because summoning is a big part of that subclass. Uh, but as I looked more and more into summoning, I found that there's not a lot of information out there, but there's lots of opinions out there. So I decided that I kind of needed a separate video to just talk about summoning because there's a lot to cover. Uh, we need to cover why players, including me, really like summoning. But we also need to talk about the ways that summoning can really disrupt your table. Uh, let's talk about how as a player we can avoid that disruption. And let's talk about how as a DM you can avoid that disruption. Let's also talk about ways that enemies might deal with summoned creatures. Uh, let's also maybe talk about what kind of characters might do summoning, uh, as well as what spells they might be casting with summoning. And let's talk a little bit about the concentration mechanic. And finally, let's talk about how to use summoning effectively. So that's a pretty full video. So let's get started. So first, let's talk a little bit about why players like summoning spells and why I like summoning spells. Summoning spells can do so many things, but really probably the first thing you think about is offense because a lot of summoning spells will summon several creatures, but even if they only summon one creature, often that single creature gets multiple attacks. So that's a bunch of extra attacks you're adding to your turn. A fifth level druid casting a conjure animal spell might get an additional eight attacks around. Now, even if those attacks individually aren't as powerful as a single attack from a player character, because there are so many, the events provided by a summoning spell can be very significant. But another way summoning spells can be used is battlefield control, because those summoned creatures take up space. So we, for example, as a caster, might have summoned creatures block off enemies so that they can't attack us. We might also have them in positions that make it impossible for enemies to get to certain locations. Never mind the fact that a lot of summoned creatures can control the battlefield in other ways, whether it's by using webs or knocking enemies prone. Lots of ways that summon spells can be used to control a battlefield. One of my favorite ways that summoning spells can be used is to protect my fellow PCs because Number one, a summoned creature can draw enemy attacks, and any enemy attack that attacks a summoned creature doesn't attack a PC. So that's always good, because that's damage the PCs don't need to take, it's damage the PCs don't need to heal after the combat, and I don't really care if a summoned creature takes damage, that's kind of what they're for. Summoned creatures also can make great scouts. Remember, with a Conjure Elemental spell, we can even summon an Invisible Stalker, which is an invisible scout, an amazing scout. Uh, but even lower level creatures, we often have a duration of an hour, so that can give us a long time that we can send creatures ahead to do scouting for us. And the advantage there is sometimes there are creatures that maybe aren't going to stand out, or in other cases, maybe it's just a case where if the creature gets attacked and killed, it's not a big deal. Uh, sometimes enemies might reveal themselves by attacking a scout that's in front of a party. Uh, so then a party that's behind and being stealthy now can have the jump on the enemy. A summon spell can also be a trap detector. Are you worried there's a trap in the hallway? You can send your summoned creature ahead. Are you worried there's a trap on the chest? Well then have your summoned creature open that chest while well, the party remains safely back. It can save the party taking damage, might even save PC death, uh, and all we're really risking is a, a spell effect. Now, when I do spell videos, I always get told about how uh, spells that maybe target weak saving throws are particularly useful against creatures with magic resistance. I get told about how spells or special effects or stunning fists might burn through legendary resistances. Uh, and I always come back the same way. I always say that the best way to deal with magic resistance, the best way to deal with legendary resistance, isn't to try to circumnavigate it or burn through it, it's to not deal with it at all. Summoning is a great way to do that. A summoned creature doesn't care if the target it's attacking has magic resistance, doesn't care if it has legendary resistance. Neither of those things protect a creature against attacks from a summoned creature. Summoning also is great for the action economy. 
this is kind of common knowledge that adding actions adds a lot of power to your side in a combat. Uh, so just having creatures that can not only attack, they could also do something like the aid another action, or they could, if you're using optional rules on flanking, they can provide flanking, or they might even just be drawing enemy opportunity attacks by moving out of enemy squares. And remember then, if the enemy takes that opportunity attack, then that enemy can't cast shields, can't cast counter spells, can't do opportunity attacks on other members of the party. Uh, so we are removing their action economy uh, well, we're helping our own. Another way summoning is great is spell versatility because a lot of summoned creatures have spells of their own or they have special abilities of their own that somewhat emulate spells. So we might do an earth elemental who might be able to glide through earth. Technically, that's not a spell, but it's kind of spell-like. Or we might summon a coaddle that has all kinds of spells. Or if we're doing something like a conjure woodland beings, we could summon a couple of dryads that have a bunch of spells each. Uh, so there are a lot of ways that we can access spells that we wouldn't necessarily have on our list through summoning spells. And finally, the last reason I like summoning spells is they're not dependent on our casting ability score. Nobody needs to make a saving throw. There's no random effects that are reliant on our ability score. So even PCs like rangers that maybe don't have a great wisdom can use something like a conjure animals to the same effect that any other caster could. This means that summoning spells tend to work well when they're combined with things like multi-classing or for some reason we have a character that doesn't have the best primary ability score. So if summoning is so great, why do so many people dislike it? Because there are a lot of people who don't even allow summoning at their table or they just resent it if anyone takes summoning. And there's good reasons for that. The first is summoning means you're going to have two turns for one player because those creatures are going to be rolling their own initiative normally. And that means you're going to have one turn for the player and one turn for the player's conjured creatures. So if you are playing at a table where you have, say, four PCs, normally you would be waiting for three turns and the DM's turn before you get your next turn. Soon as somebody does a summoning spell, that slows down. So that's more time that you're not involved in the combat. But the second thing is that a lot of summoning spells will also summon several creatures. I mean, right from third level spells, a druid can be summoning eight creatures with one spell. That means eight movements. That means eight actions. That means deciding what eight individual things are going to do, where they're placed. This can be incredibly time consuming, far more time consuming than a typical turn. So not only is that one player taking two turns every round, but one of those turns might be very, very time consuming. So suddenly we're waiting a long time before we can be doing anything else. So what happens? Well, what happens is we start looking at our phones or talking to the other players because we're bored. And soon as we're bored, it's contagious and everyone gets bored. And that can be disastrous for a game session. And there are a lot of other things that can slow things down as well. Looking up creature statistics, considering the various options that creatures have. I mean, imagine that you have eight giant spiders and then you're deciding where each one is going to move, whether it's going to do its web, whether it's going to do its attack. One turn can be absolutely brutal. Then remember, with a lot of these spells, the DM determines what creatures are summoned. So the player cast conjure animals says, I'm going to conjure eight creatures. Now the DM has to decide what creatures they are. Now the player's handbook doesn't tell you what creatures are available. So now the DM is maybe thumbing through the monster manual, looking at CR one quarter creatures, trying to figure out what gets summoned. And that can take a long time. And if you're casting multiple summoning spells in one session, that again could just have a brutal effect on your session. The next thing that can happen is if you're playing on a map, there can be a real overcrowding because normally you would have, say, four PCs and then maybe you got four enemies, but suddenly you throw on eight summoned creatures. They might even be large sized and suddenly there's just miniatures everywhere and it's hard to visualize what's going on uh, and it can take people out of the action. The other thing is, is that players can end up getting blocked because maybe they're playing a PC that's a barbarian with a two-handed sword and they want to get at the enemy but there's some creatures in the way and now not only do they have to wait so long for their turn but once their turn arrives 
they can't even do the attack they were waiting for. So just imagine how frustrating that can be. So with all these things, I completely understand why some DMs ban summoning spells. But there are things we can do as a player, and there are things we can do as a DM that make summoning work at the table way better. So the first thing is, if you are going to play a character that's going to have summoning spells, this is what you can do. If you are going to cast a summoning spell, never ever decide that on your turn. Always decide before your turn that you're going to summon, what you're going to summon, and where it's going to go. Always decide before your turn begins that you're going to use a summoning spell. Make sure that summoning spell is open in the player's handbook or on D&D Beyond or on your spell cards or however you access it uh, so that it's easy for you to reference and easy for your DM to reference. Have some thought about where you're going to position those creatures on the map before your DM tells you what they are. And finally, if it is a spell where the DM is going to pick the creature, then make sure you have the options available. Just a little list for the DM to see what their options are for that challenge rating. Uh, now, if you use D&D Beyond, they are nice enough to already have that on those spells. So if I cast Conjure Animals and I have D&D Beyond, I can open it up, just show it to the DM, and then they can see the list and they can just pick one. Uh, and then by just tapping on that creature, the statistics come up. Uh, so that works really well. But if you don't use D&D Beyond, then do a little bit of homework. Before you play, you already know you have this spell. So take a look at what your options are for each challenge rating. Write out a list and then let, let your DM decide. And make sure that you have the appropriate statistics available so that you can access them quickly. So when it is the creature's turn, you're going to have the statistics ready. Also, if there are multiple creatures, don't be afraid to use multiple dice. I mean, I play with people who they have one 20-sided die. So they have three attacks, they roll it, and then they roll it again, and then they roll it again. But if you are going to have eight summoned creatures, you cannot be doing that. If you're going to have three summoned creatures attack the same enemy, that's three 20-sided dice. You roll it, two of them hit, who cares which two it was. The other thing, especially if you have multiple summoned creatures, is get the table involved. The other players maybe don't have direct control over these summoned creatures, but you as a player and as a table can make it a collaborative experience. So maybe if you have eight creatures, everyone controls two of them. Or maybe you just talk about, as a group, what the creatures are going to do, where they're going to move. Get the other players involved in that movement. Don't just hog it all for yourself because you're taking all this additional time. That time is fine as long as everyone's involved because if everyone's involved, then they don't feel like they're missing out. Now, keeping track of all these creatures can also be hard, especially because you're keeping track of hit points for all these different creatures. So my suggestion to you is this. What you're going to do is you're going to take a d20 uh, and then you're going to place it on the map instead of a mini. And then what you'll do is you'll put the number equal to the hit points of the creature. Uh, and then for the next creature, you use another d20, and so on and so on. And then as you take damage, you shift the number to the new hit points. Now, in some cases, creatures have more than 20 hit points. Then you can use percentile dice. They don't fit as nicely on the map, uh, but they can work in a pinch. Once they have 20 hit points or less, you can just replace them with the d20. And finally, when it comes to overcrowding the battlefield and potentially blocking other PCs, the quick answer to that is just don't do it, right? You see where the map is. You see how much room there is. Imagine if you get eight large creatures, what they're going to look like on that map. If it's too crowded, don't summon eight creatures. Summon four creatures instead. Summoning four creatures is still going to be effective, and you are going to solve that problem all on your own. When we are talking about spells where you can choose the number of creatures that you summon, you get to choose the number of creatures you can summon. You can summon one creature if there's not a lot of room. Don't be afraid to do that. Summoning is still effective. Remember, you're getting a higher challenge rating creature, so it's not like it suddenly becomes a bad spell. I agree. If you get the eight creatures, that's probably mechanically the best because we're separating as many hit points as we can. Often the total hit points ends up being a lot more. We're covering more spots on the battlefield. We're getting more attacks. Uh, we're getting more from the action economy. 
So summoning less creatures is often less mechanically optimal, but when it comes to making sure that the Barbarian can get at the enemy with their two-handed sword, if you block that, you're not being optimal because you're taking the best offense you have in the party and then you're neutralizing it. So if we take those things into consideration, then suddenly having the four creatures or the two creatures might actually be the optimal choice, as well as being a good player and being sensitive to the other people at the table. The final thing you should do as a player to make the experience better for everyone at the table is as soon as you're going to be able to access summoning. So the moment your character is going to have a summon spell prepared, make sure your DM knows ahead of time. Uh, then your DM can make some preparations that can also help things move faster. So now let's say you're the DM and one of the players now has access to a summoning spell. So what things can you do to make things run smoother? Well, I mentioned that the player might want to have a list of creatures available. You as a DM might want to have a list of creatures available too. Uh, that way you can have in your head already what kind of creature is more likely to appear. You might want something maybe even setting appropriate and you can make those decisions beforehand. So, so if the druid's going to be summoning challenge rating one quarter creatures, they're going to get giant toads because they're in a swamp. And if they're going to be summoning half challenge rating creatures, they're going to get this or one challenge rating creatures, they're going to get that. Uh, and then you will know beforehand. So the moment they cast a spell and they say how many creatures they're doing, you can select a creature immediately. The other thing you can do is make sure the statistics to that creature are handy. Uh, so again, if the player does it, that's great. If the DM does it, that's great, but somebody should do it. The other thing you can do as a DM is you're the leader of this group. So you are allowed to set some guidelines. You might say to a player that you don't want them overcrowding the battlefield. You might say to a player that if you start blocking other PCs, I'll consider banning these spells. You might say that if they summon multiple creatures, they need to get everyone else involved, or that maybe you're going to be the one who's assigning who's going to be controlling which creature. Also remember, sometimes summon creatures aren't controlled by the players at all. If we do something like a summon lesser demon spell, those demons are hostile to the players, and you as the DM will be controlling them. So. My recommendation is normally a player is going to summon those creatures on the opposite side of a battlefield because they don't want those creatures attacking the PCs. So you've got a group of enemies and the PCs are on one side and then they summon maybe a summon lesser demons on the other side and those summon lesser demons start attacking the enemy. So rather than sit there and roll dice and make the players wait Will you determine what these enemies do to those enemies and then what those enemies do to these enemies. Just come up with a narration, right? Maybe this creature is removed and that creature is removed. And just leave it at that. Uh, it's so much faster for the players. They don't need to know every single thing that happened, every single attack that hit, every single attack that missed. Uh, and it doesn't matter if it's completely random because the players are not directly involved. Narrating that part just makes things move faster and it's not going to detract from your game. The other thing I recommend is if there are multiple summoned creatures, note that when you're in the monster manual, it talks about the amount of damage a creature does and it'll represent a random roll and then it'll give you an average amount. So with summon creatures, if you just use those average amounts, things are going to move a lot faster. There's going to be a lot less dice rolls. So if something's supposed to be a D8 plus 2 and it says, well, it's either going to be a D8 plus 2 or 7, just use 7. 7 will be faster. Now, a couple cautions on the other side. I recommend you don't ban summoning at your table. I mean, it's one thing to set guidelines. It's one thing to make preparations to ensure it moves quickly, to make sure everyone's involved. But if you absolutely get rid of summoning, just understand that you're getting rid of a kind of magic that's unique and interesting. And so you are limiting the creativity of players in your game. Now, normally a DM doesn't want to do that. Just be aware that if you ban an entire subcategory of spells, that's exactly what you're doing. I also recommend that if you allow summoning spells, that you're fair with them. Uh, what I mean by fair, well, if you look at the spells, any of the spells where a DM picks the creature, it will say that a DM will pick a creature of this challenge rating or less. Now, my belief is that the reason for that is because 
Maybe a challenge rating creature of that challenge rating isn't appropriate, so a DM might look a little bit below that to see what else is available. But don't just pick creatures that are lower challenge ratings than the maximum. Doing that is just kind of screwing over the player. Uh, it's not really the way that's supposed to be intended, to my knowledge. Uh, so all you're doing is you're making summoning bad. Summoning shouldn't be bad. Summoning should be good. Summoning should be fun and interesting. If you're going to allow it at your table, let it be fun. But that doesn't mean, as a DM, that we shouldn't be smart when we deal with summoned creatures. If a PC summons creatures, there is no reason why a smart enemy won't be smart in the way they deal with them. I mean, the easiest way to deal with a summoned creature, and certainly the way I would expect maybe an unintelligent enemy to deal with a creature, is to kill all the summoned creatures, because the summoned creatures tend to not have a whole lot of hit points, and they tend not to have a great armor class, and they're in the way. So to have the enemies turn on the summoned creatures, waste their attacks on the summoned creatures, makes perfect sense in some circumstances. But if we have an intelligent enemy and somebody who's to be a challenging adversary for the party, we have some other options. Uh, the first is Counterspell. If your enemy has Counterspell, Counterspelling a Summoning Spell makes a lot of sense because a Summoning Spell really changes the battle. So if an enemy is going to be saving a Counterspell for an important situation, stopping a Summoning Spell to me seems to be one of those situations. The second one, and this one is a little bit debatable, is Dispel Magic. And we need to talk a little bit about Dispel Magic because the rules aren't super clear on how Dispel Magic and Summon Creatures interact. There is a Sage Advice that deals with dealing with Dispel Magic as well as Anti-Magic fields with Summoned Creatures. And what it kind of implies is if a Summoned Creature moves into an Anti-Magic field, it's suppressed. But if a Summoned Creature is hit with the Dispel Magic, it disappears. What it doesn't say is, if there are, say, eight creatures, whether the dispel magic will make one of them disappear or make them all disappear. So as a DM, you probably should be thinking about that beforehand, and you should probably be making that clear to the table beforehand so everyone's on the same page on how dispel magic interacts with the summon spell. And I don't think there's a wrong answer. If you want to have it dispel one creature, that's fine. If you want to have it dispel all the creatures, that's fine. I don't think either of them ruin the balance of your game. Uh, and as long as everyone's on the same page and they know how it's supposed to work, understand that raw rules as written, don't specifically dictate it working one way or the other way. There are phrases in the rules, in sage advice, that can be interpreted either way. Uh, so if you want to have it dispel all the creatures, that's perfectly fine. Just make sure your players know that beforehand. But honestly, the best way to deal with a summon spell is interrupt concentration. All these spells will be requiring concentration. And if an enemy sees eight new enemies pop up, and one person concentrating, it makes a ton of sense to concentrate all your attacks on that caster. Uh, and now often those casters can't even take a whole lot of damage. They might not even have a great armor class. Uh, and they might be in a lot of trouble if you concentrate your attacks on them. But so be it. Those are the risks of doing spells that are super effective. So speaking about concentration, as a player, what can you do to protect your character who is maybe concentrating on a spell? Uh, well, the first thing is your summon creatures might be protecting you, so they might be around you. That's not going to protect you from spells, that's not going to protect you from ranged attacks, but it can protect you from melee attacks. Another thing is, if you are a conjurer and you're 10th level or higher, then you cannot lose your concentration from taking damage. So that combination actually works really well with summoning. But other than that, what can you do? Well, you cannot ignore your defenses. Use the dodge action. Maybe hide as your action. Use spells that don't require concentration and that can boost your defenses. Gain cover. These are all good ways to maintain your concentration in the combat. Uh, because just be prepared. If you bring eight enemies onto the battlefield, it makes perfect sense why an intelligent enemy might target you. Now, I get told that there are a couple ways to avoid concentration entirely for a summoning spell. And I don't think either of them work. Uh, so I just want to talk about each of them uh, individually. The first one is using a Glyph of Warding. So with the Glyph of Warding, what we can do is we can cast a spell in it beforehand. Uh, and then when we trigger that spell, it goes off, and that spell will not require concentration. Uh, 
Now, normally that would need to be a spell that either targets somebody or is an area of effect. Uh, now, summoning shouldn't be either of those, but there's one exception. And that exception is Conjure Elemental, because the wording within the text of Conjure Elemental says that you are targeting a 10 foot by 10 foot by 10 foot cube of a substance, whether it's fire or water or air. So based on that text, a DM might consider that to be an area of effect spell. But the effect of this spell is not covering an area. It's just targeting an area. So at least the way I interpret it, that is still not applicable to a glyph of warding. And certainly I think with the rules as they are intended, it's not supposed to be applicable for a glyph of warding. So by the way I read it, even conjure elementals cannot be cast through a glyph of warding. The other one I get told about is planar binding. And I recently talked about planar binding in a video and I had all kinds of comments down below uh, saying that once you do planar binding on a summoned creature, once the initial spell of summoning expires and we get into that 24 hour duration from the planar binding, that doesn't require concentration. Now that's not the way I interpret the spell. Now, according to the planar binding spell, what it does is if you use planar binding on a creature that's been summoned with another spell, then it extends the duration of that spell to equal the planar binding. So if you say cast a conjure elementals and then you cast a planar binding on the conjured elemental, then what you've done is you've taken the conjure elemental spell that normally has a one hour duration and you extend its duration to 24 hours. That's what the planar binding spell does. It's not replacing the duration, it's extending it. And that's very clear in the text, at least as far as I'm concerned. Now, the response I had to that was a lot of people said, yeah, but what if you upcast planar binding? It can last for days. You can't concentrate when you're sleeping. So why would they make a spell where you cannot maintain the concentration for the duration of the spell? And to that, I would say planar binding doesn't have to be cast on a creature that you conjured. That is just one of the options of that spell. And if you use that option, then you follow the text within the planar binding spell, which says that we're not replacing the summoning spell with a planar binding. We are extending the summoning spell to match the planar binding. So by at least my interpretation of the rules, there is no way to avoid concentrating on a summon spell. So who might we expect to summon in D&D? Well, the first is the Druid. The Druid is probably our best summoner in D&D. And that is largely because Conjure Animals is a third level spell, which means a Druid is going to get a very powerful summoning spell right at fifth level. Uh, and then they're going to follow it up with other powerful summoning spells after that. So they just continue getting great summoning spells right from fifth level onwards. Now of the Druid, the best summoner, of course, is the Circle of the Shepherd, which is really obviously centered around summoning. One of the best things that it gets is summon creatures will be able to use their attacks as if they are magical, which is going to bypass all kinds of resistances. Very, very few things are resistant to magical weapons, though many, many things are resistant to non-magical weapons or immune altogether. So being able to bypass that is a big deal. Also, there are abilities that the Circle of the Shepherd gets that are going to give all their creatures a bunch more hit points uh, and a bunch of healing at the end of combat. So all in all, the Circle of the Shepherd is by far the best of the subclasses of Druid for summoning, though all Druids are actually reasonably good at summoning. The second kind of summoner you can expect is the Wizard. Now the Wizard doesn't come into its own as early with summoning spells, and because Wizards have such a great spell list, summoning doesn't stand out as much as it does on the Druid list. Now, technically, a uh, Wizard can be summoning right at fifth level as well uh, with a Summon Lesser Demon spell, but Summon Lesser Demons has a lot of problems with it not controlling the demons being the primary problem. So we might not be seeing wizards summoning until later anyways. Uh, but if we are playing a wizard and we're going to be doing summoning, our best choice by far is the conjurer. Not only does the conjurer get the ability to add hit points to summon creatures later on, but the big thing is because they can cast conjure spells without worrying about breaking concentration, as we already discussed, a smart enemy is going to be concentrating attacks on the summoner, trying to break concentration. Having your concentration not be able to be broken by taking damage is huge for summoning. 
uh, and it makes the Conjurer a very good choice for a summoner. The next kind of summoner you might see is the Warlock. Uh, the Warlock has access to basically the same summoning spells that the Wizard has. Note that the Sorcerer does not. You're not going to see much in the way of Sorcerers as summoners, but Warlocks basically have the same summon spells that a uh, wizard is going to have. They don't have any special abilities that are going to necessarily make those summon spells better. Uh, but if I'm a warlock, summoning spells are still a pretty good option, especially when we're talking about spells like Conjure Elemental. Uh, so they might very well be choices I make. The next kind of summoner you might see is a cleric. Now, a cleric is not going to be into summoning until later because they don't get access to summoning spells till later. But eventually, they're going to get Conjure Celestial and Planar Ally. And these are summon spells that are usually going to give you a single summoned creature that you can control. And clerics, as of ninth level, Conjure Celestial is actually a really good spell. Uh, getting a Coatl gives you all kinds of spells available as well as combat abilities. Uh, so very reasonable for a cleric to do so around ninth level. So I might expect to see your clerics start to become summoners around that ninth level period, uh, and then it maybe isn't going to carry on much past 11th level. The next kind of summoner you might see are rangers. Now, because rangers have a slower spell progression, we're not going to see them summoning as early as we do druids. But they are going to get access to the same great summoning spells that druids have. And because summon spells don't rely on a casting stat, rangers actually are really going to gravitate towards those spells because they're effective and they're not going to be in any way hindered by not having a great wisdom score. And the final kind of summoner you might see are bards, because bards of course can select summoning through magical secrets. Now a lore bard might select something like conjure animals, so you might be seeing something like a lore bard doing some summoning right by level 6, uh, but other bards might be selecting uh, summoning spells as a 10th level magical secrets. If they do, something like a glamour bard can be quite good because they can provide a lot of temporary hit points to a lot of different creatures, uh, which can really boost up a bunch of summon creatures, especially ones that are around for a reasonable length of time. And that's pretty much it. As I said, sorcerers aren't really going to get access to much in the way of summoning, uh, and paladins aren't going to get much in the way of summoning. They can summon a horse or a steed, and that's about it. Uh, so those are the classes where we're tending to see summoning, mostly with the druids. So what summoning spells are good for players? Well, when I am evaluating a summoning spell, I'm looking at a few different things. The first thing I'm going to look at is the casting time because summon spells tend to be either one action to cast or one minute to cast. If it is a one minute casting time, obviously we are going to have to cast it outside of combat. And the reason why this is a significant downside is it means we can't place it in the combat because one of the tactical advantages of a one action casting summon spell is we might see a place where a creature could just appear in combat that could be super useful to us. It might block an enemy, it might protect an ally. If the summoned creature is just another creature in combat that was right beside the PCs, it may not be able to move into those positions that are advantageous to you. The second thing I look for is control of the creatures, uh, because that is not a guarantee. If you are a druid, you're pretty much going to have control of your creatures. Keep in mind that there are certain spells, like Conjure Elemental, where if you lose your concentration, then the creature doesn't disappear, you just lose control over it. And that can be significantly worse than it disappearing. But creatures like Summon Lesser Demons, or Summon Greater Demon, or Infernal Calling, uh, either don't provide you control at all, or they provide you limited control, or control that can be broken. So when I look at a spell, when I see that, that's a big downside. Because especially if we're looking at a one hour duration spell, if a creature is getting a saving throw every round to break our control, it is going to make that saving throw in a lot less than an hour. So we're likely to only get a combat out of that spell rather than maybe several combats. The next thing I'm going to look at is who picks the creature. Uh, because some spells will allow the player to pick the creature and other spells allow the DM to pick the creature. Uh, so obviously there is a huge advantage to us picking our own creature. Uh, but in some cases where we might pick a certain challenge rating, like maybe challenge rating 2, and there's just not very many options for a DM to pick. So a good example of this is 
conjure woodland beings. With conjure woodland beings, we can choose to summon two challenge rating one creatures. Uh, so if we do that, then the DM picks the creature, but there's only two creatures within the official rule sets that fit that description. And if you're using the monster manual, there's only one. Uh, that is the Dryad. And so then the Dryad has some spell-like abilities and some combat abilities. And you as a player will know exactly what you're going to get as soon as you pick the number of creatures. Now, if your DM has Morden Caden's Guide to Foes, then the Quickling is another option. So now there's still only two options. It just means there's a lot less variance so you have a lot better idea what you're going to get. Uh, but still, if the DM is picking the creature, generally speaking, that's a downside to this spell. Another thing I look when I'm evaluating spell is, are there any creatures I can pick that have cool, neat, or spell-like abilities? Uh, because it's one thing to cast the spell, get a creature, and have it just attack enemies. Uh, but you can give me 20 different options of creatures that are just bags of hit points that can attack enemies, and it doesn't really matter which one I get. But if you give me a couple options where there are some spells available or some special abilities available, that spell becomes a whole lot more potent because there's so many more things I can do with it. So that said, I think there are a few summoning spells that really stand out as effective. The first is Conjure Animals. So Conjure Animals has the downside that the DM picks the creature, but it has the upside that there's a versatility that we can summon one creature or we can summon up to eight creatures. Uh, it is a one action casting time, which means we can now place those creatures where they're effective in combat. One hour duration is good duration, and we have control over those creatures. So all kinds of good things about this spell, and it's only level three. Another spell, that summoning that I think is really good is Conjure Celestial. So if I'm a cleric, that's a spell I'm definitely going to consider. And there's really only one creature I would consider summoning with that spell, and that's the Coatl, which I already talked about. All kinds of spell-like abilities on Coatl, and it's a reasonably good creature even without the spells. So we summon a Coatl, we have an hour-long duration, we're going to get all kinds of spells, and it can help us in combat in a number of different ways. Uh, so it's a very effective use of a summoning spell. Now. Conjure Celestial has the downside that it has the one minute casting time, which means we have to cast it outside of combat. But within those bounds, there's still a lot of good in this spell. Summon Greater Demon is a good spell for both Warlocks and for Wizards. The downside of this spell is that it has limited control over the creature, and it's going to get a saving throw every round, and it's likely going to make that save in not too long. But the good thing is, is there's a number of different demons you can pick from that have really cool abilities or spell-like abilities. Now, even if that creature is going to break your control, there's a good chance you're going to be able to maintain that control for a round or two. That gives you a chance to use those neat abilities or spells. And the final spell that I'm going to highlight is Conjure Elemental. Uh, because Conjure Elemental, just the standard elementals, the four elementals, have a ton of hit points, a ton of resistances. They're reasonably good offensively, and they have some special abilities, so there's all kinds of good things about them. And just by targeting air, and there's always air around, uh, just by targeting air, we can pretty much be guaranteed to get an air elemental, which is a, the best of the options, in my opinion, because it has such great maneuverability and speed and flight uh, without giving up any of the offense. So finally, let's talk about how should we be using summoning spells optimally. Well, the first thing we want to do is we want to think about placement. Whether we're placing the spell in a combat because it's a one action cast or we've cast it before combat and that creature is going to move, where that creature ends up being is going to make a difference in that combat. We want that creature to be attacked. Uh, so I love to put that creature in a place where the enemies kind of need to go through it. Definitely between me and the enemy is a lovely place for that creature to be because I'm not swinging a great sword. Uh, so if those enemies want to come at me and they have to go through my summon creatures, perfect. The second thing you can do to use summon spells effectively is know your options. If you have the summon greater demon spell, then you are going to be selecting the creature. And the variances in creatures is significant. You're going to get significantly different abilities, significantly different spell-like abilities, significantly different combat abilities. Know what they are beforehand. If we know beforehand that in this situation, I just want a brute. Tanaruk is my best option. It is going to save you flipping through monster manuals. It's going to save everyone waiting. So it's better for your table, but it's also optimal because you already know what your best option is and you don't make a mistake. The 
Third thing is know the spell-like abilities or the creature abilities of the creatures you summon. If you are going to summon and get a bunch of giant spiders, know what the web can do. Know what the attack can do, what the poison is, what the DC is. Uh, and then that is going to help you make the decisions on what those spiders are going to do with their actions. Number three, if you cast something like a Seven Greater Damien spell, let's say you upcast it and you get a Vrock. So the Vrock has this spore-like ability that it can be using very limited. So what do we want to do? On round one, we want to use it. We want to use every ability we can from that creature that's limited use as fast as possible. Well, we still have control because what that's going to do is it's going to prevent it from being able to use those abilities on you if it breaks control later. Number three, never protect your creatures. Don't worry about how much damage your creatures are taking. Don't worry about protecting your creatures. If creatures are taking damage that's damage that the PCs aren't taking, that's a good thing. I want to make my summoned creatures as an attractive target as possible to the enemy. I want them to be in the way. I want them to be drawing opportunity attacks. I want them to have a low armor class. I want the enemies to hit them and do damage to them. Every time that happens, my summoning spells are doing exactly what I wanted them to do. And the final recommendation for using summoning spells effectively is protect your concentration. If you are going to be a summoner, it is not your casting ability score that's the most important. It is your concentration. Now that is partially defended by having a good constitution and having a good constitution saving throw, but it can also be affected by not taking damage in the first place. If we have good armor class, if we have ways to prevent enemies from attacking us that are not going to require a concentration, then that is going to protect our concentration. Also keep in mind that feats like Warcaster or Lucky can also help you make your concentration saves when you need to. If you can maintain your concentration, you're going to find that summoning can be an incredibly effective thing in combat. And if you are a conscientious player, and if you're a DM, if you're a conscientious DM, you will find that it can be not overly disruptive to your table as well. So happy summoning to everyone. And next week, we're going to talk about the Circle of the Shepherd Druid. And then we're really going to talk about some Druid summoning spells. So I hope you'll join me then. Until then, I'm going to sit back and relax. And I'm going to have some fun because D&D is for everyone. Thanks, Optimancers, and I'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.